Hello, everyone. I hope that you all are having a wonderful Wednesday. I am just going to do my due diligence again to make sure that I am actually streaming. Perfect. Looks like Facebook's working. Um, I'm streaming again. This is the second week where I am also doing it on my YouTube channel and um, also in Facebook. So just need to make sure that it's working in both places. Oh, that's not what I want. All right. Well, let's hope that this is actually streaming in my... There we go. Looks like it's working. Okay, me and technology. Sorry, guys. Um, I am really excited um, to get back to talking about mitochondria. Um, I don't know if you were able to watch the last video. Um, that's where I kind of just dove more into the introduction of what our mitochondria are, what they do, um, you know, where they're located, what can lead them to become dysfunctional. Um, if anyone watched that, please let me know in the comments, you know, what you thought about it, if you have any questions at all from it. Um, and kind of what your takeaways were. Uh, we touched base towards the end on different nutrients that can support your mitochondria, but we didn't get into necessarily the foods and where you can find these different nutrients um, and the dietary pattern. So that is what we are going to be looking at today is more of those dietary patterns to um, support our mitochondria. So like I spoke of last week, uh, mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. So they aid in the creation of ATP, which is our body's energy fuel. Um, so our body, you know, in order to do different uh, processes and chemicals and like be able to move our hands like this or be able to talk, um, it's going through a lot of different chemical processes in order to do that, in order to be able to like make my hand go from here to there. Like there's a lot of stuff that happens in there in the body. Um, for that to happen. And so in order to initiate these different um, reactions or in, normal, in, in order to have the energy to do it, we need that ATP. So our mitochondria helps produce um, that and aid in that ATP. So our mitochondria is located within each cell except red blood cells, but every other cell it's located in. Um, this Krebs cycle takes place here. And that's where, you know, we utilize our macronutrients um, and our nutrients into turning that into energy and ATP. Um, and our mitochondria have their own DNA. They're responsible for fatty acid oxidation, amino acid oxidation, calcium homeostasis, and apoptosis, which is programmed cell death in the body. Um, they're in charge of iron metabolism and heme synthesis steroid synthesis, thermogenesis, and immune system function. Uh, so that's a lot of things. Um, all organs and systems require energy to function properly. Therefore, all systems and organisms are dependent on the function of our mitochondria. So when they start to go haywire or get dysfunctional, our systems are going to start to see repercussions of that. Um, our body is going to see repercussions of that. And you don't necessarily have to have fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, an autoimmune condition to have issues with your mitochondria. You know, we are have, finding dysfunction because of toxins in the environment, toxins in the food that we're eating, um, toxic lifestyles of chronic stress and chronic inflammation. Um, basically, everyone in our society probably has, a, I mean, is leaning, gearing towards mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, and then there's obviously mitochondrial dysfunction based off of genetic, genetic mutations that people are born with and stuff too. So there are, you know, mitochondrial diseases out there, but I am talking more on the ones that we accumulate and 
gather this dysfunction because of high levels of stress, because of autoimmune conditions or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue, um, what have you. So that's, that's what I am focusing on. So I'm going to go over the key nutrients that I talked about last, <clears throat> last Wednesday, but I'm going to give you the picture of where you can find these nutrients in your foods. And then I'm going to talk about some dietary patterns too. So like I mentioned, the B vitamins are very supportive for our mitochondria. So they stimulate defective coenzymes. They um, play a key role in mitochondrial function and energy production. So thiamine plays a role in the citric acid cycle or our Krebs cycle, and it helps. This, it actually helps to start that cycle. So foods that are rich in thiamine, think of like organic pork, fish, black beans, squash, um, a lot of those meats and, you know, organ meats are going to be great for like B vitamins in general. Uh, riboflavin plays a role in our respiratory chain and food sources include liver, yogurt, milk, beef, mushroom, shellfish, and quinoa. Um, NAD plus um, and, and supporting NAD plus or NADH, um, we really are looking at, we get that synthesis of those from niacin. So niacin-rich foods are going to be your liver, your chicken, your beef, your brown rice, peanuts and potatoes, some coffee as well. But um, I really want people to be, you know, wary of coffee. You can find a lot of mold in coffee beans, all of that. Apologize, my hair is like going a little crazy today. Um, but NAD plus or NADH um, is a key component of oxidative phosphorylation, which is a huge part of our mitochondria. Um, panathenic acid or B5 is part of coenzyme A and plays a role in beta oxidation. Uh, food sources include beef liver, mushrooms, sunflower seeds, chicken, and avocados. Pyridoxine or B6 acts as an antioxidant and is a cofactor in many enzymatic reactions. It plays a key role in amino acid metabolism as well. As well. And so food sources are going to that are rich in it are going to be like garbanzo beans, liver, tuna, chicken, potatoes, turkey, bananas. Biotin, also known as B7, is required for fatty acid oxidation and gluconeogenesis as a coenzyme. And um, <clears throat> food sources are going to include egg, really great source of um, biotin, beef liver, salmon, pork, sunflower seeds, sweet potatoes. Folate or B9 is necessary for the maintenance of our mitochondrial DNA and more. It's also huge in our you know, methylation processes too. So about a third to a fifth of folate are located in our mitochondria. So food sources are of this are going to include liver, spinach, black eyed peas, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, a lot of those cruciferous vegetables and dark leafy greens are high in folate. Uh, cobalamin or B12. Uh, plays a role in mitochondrial DNA as well, and amino acid synthesis, as well as fat and carbohydrate metabolism. So food sources of our B12 are going to be very high in our animal products. Um, so if you're vegetarian or vegan, a lot of times you're going to have to take a B12 supplement. You can find B12 in like nutritional yeast and stuff too, um, or, you know, added into foods, so fortified foods, which... I kind of want people to stay away from these fortified foods because that means that they've been highly processed. And now we need you know, now we need to add in back our nutrients. Um, so we want to try to really steer clear of these processed foods. Um, but you can find B12 in clams, beef liver, uh, trout, salmon, beef, milk, cheese. Those are going to be some of your highest sources, especially the organ meats, um, especially those livers. Uh, from our beef or our chicken. Beef is going to be really, really rich source of it, but chicken is also good too. Um, and magnesium. So magnesium is very supportive for our mitochondria, for our cells and our body in general, uh, for our brain health, for our immune health, like so many great things when it comes to magnesium. It is a cofactor in our ATP metabolism. Uh, again, ATP is that energy fuel. Food sources are going to be that are high in magnesium will be like spinach, kale, broccoli, pumpkin seeds are great, bananas, avocados, um, even dark chocolate. 
So acetyl L-carnitine that I mentioned the last Wednesday, this one transports acetyl-CoA into the mitochondria for fatty acid oxidation to create, help create that energy for the cell. Um, and a study had shown, you know, a treatment group with L-carnitine had a significant improvement in physical fatigue, mental fatigue, and fatigue severity. So foods that are rich in carnitine, they are mainly going to be like your red meats that are very rich in it. But you can also find it in asparagus um, and chicken and, you know, poultry, or those other meats too. So creatine is another uh, potential source that, that can really be beneficial for our mitochondria as well. It acts as a buffer from our ATP and helps aid mitochondrial function. And a couple of food sources that are richer in creatine are going to be like your red meats uh, and fish is also very good too. N-acetylcysteine. This is really only found in supplements, the NAC, but cysteine helps form that, you know, um, helps form like the glutathione in the body, um, which is what NAC or N-acetylcysteine does, is it helps amp up our, our glutathione in our body, which is what we're wanting. It's the major antioxidant. Um, so if you want to take NAC as a supplement, you can, but you can also get this in from cysteine in our foods. So um, again, it increases glutathione and antioxidant defenses in the body. So foods that are really rich sources of cysteine are going to include lentils, eggs, beef, chicken, oatmeal, yogurt, pork, sunflower seeds, cheese, bone broth. I don't know if you're starting to see a pattern here, but with a lot of these foods, our proteins are going to really help our mitochondria quality, quality proteins, but we want to get a variety of them. We want to try to get those organ meats that we can, but we want to have, again, grass-fed, um, <laughs> non-GMO-fed um, meats. We want to have fish. We want to, you know, get a variety of seafood in because we're going to have a lot of great things when it comes to those omega-3 fats. Um, so there's a lot when it comes to our proteins, getting it from nuts and seeds, um, and then some of the squashes are also really good too for all of these nutrients that I've been listing so far. Um, CoQ10 is a component of three of the five enzyme complexes of oxidative phosphorylation. It's the essential bionutrient and our bodies produce less and less of it as we get older, unfortunately. It's just part of the aging process. So we really want to support it. Um, it's a fat-soluble antioxidant that provides protection against damage caused by harmful free radicals. Think of reactive oxygen species um, that our mitochondria do produce as a byproduct. And when our mitochondria are in that dysfunction mode, um, we create more of the reactive oxygen species uh, or ROS, which go around and are actually very harmful to our body and the other cells in our body. So. We want to have antioxidants, which go around and like they're little fighters that try to protect ourselves from these reactive oxygen species. Um, so I hope that made sense to you. <laughs> um, but that's why antioxidants are very beneficial. CoQ10 is a huge antioxidant to help fight against those reactive oxygen species. Um, a lot of medications deplete CoQ10, like I mentioned last last week. So if you want to watch that video, um, make sure that you do, because there's a lot with that. Um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack when it comes to our medication. And a lot of people are on medication for various reasons, especially people with autoimmune conditions, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. The medications that are being prescribed many times are actually hurting our mitochondria. So it's like this huge snowball effect, but I kind of took a little tangent, apologies. <laughs> I get so excited. Um, but CoQ10, major food sources of CoQ10 are gonna be broccoli, cauliflower, fish, lentils, meats, especially your grass-fed meats, organ meats, sesame seeds, soybeans. And when I say soybeans, I'm talking about organic, non-GMO soybeans. We're not talking about the, the soy that is inundated in our products, um, the GMO versions of soy, we really need high quality soy. And yes, it is going to be more expensive 
Um, it's harder to find out there. So a lot of times people, I, we steer clear from soy because of the sources are not that great. Um, spinach, cabbage, and strawberries are also great sources too of CoQ10. Lipoic acid uh, aids in conversion of food into energy. It's an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory as well. It also chelates to metals. So it aids in any detoxification of heavy metals, which a lot of us struggle with heavy, heavy metal um, toxins in our fat cells, in our body, um, because they are inundated in our supply. I don't know if anyone has heard the latest, um, and it's not really, I guess, the latest, but it's finally coming out into mainstream is that chocolate. Um, so for anyone who is enjoying chocolate, like around Easter, uh, springtime, chocolate, including the great sources of dark chocolate out there, they're seeing that cadmium and lead are really showing up in our chocolate. So for people who are like chocolate connoisseurs and loving chocolate, right there, you're getting exposures to lead and cadmium. So again, heavy metal exposure is quite frequent um, for those of us in the Western, Western countries. So um, yes, I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, heavy metal is a problem for people. So it's important that we are aiding our detoxification from it and using foods that will help chelate it and, and get rid of it. Mercury, one of the greatest chelators of mercury in the body is actually cilantro. Um, and mercury you can find in a lot of seafood and fish. Um, so I just wanted to throw out that little, little tidbit there. Um, alpha lipoic acid, um, which is similar to lipoic acid, it's just a different form. Uh, but the foods that are rich in both, you know, the lipoic acids, it's gonna be beets, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots, organ meats, tomatoes, a lot of the citrus fruits and foods, um, a lot of the cruciferous vegetables, a lot of the, um, and I will get to it, but like carrots and celery, parsley, those are gonna be great too. Um, and again, I will touch on that towards the end. Um, nicotinamide riboside or NR, like I mentioned last week, that is more, that's a supplement that helps with um, building NAD in your blood serum. So that one doesn't necessarily come from a food. What we're looking at is more of those niacin style foods like that I mentioned previously. Um, phospho, ethan phosphatidyl ethanolamine, I always struggle with that one, or PE. Um, and I don't know, like I can say it just fine, but if I go on a live, of course, I'm going to like blah, 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 mumble it up. Um, we'll just call it PE. Uh, it's an inner membrane component. Uh, it's also dependent on choline status, uh, but food sources of phospholipids in general, because phospholipids are very beneficial for our mitochondria. Um, soybeans, again, the high quality, non-GMO, organic, Egg yolk is great source of phospholipids. Milk, we're really looking for the high quality. Um, marine organisms like fish, roe, or krill, those are all going to be great too. Omega-3 fatty acids. Um, it's even found in like some coconut oil too for phospholipids. A lot of like the, the higher fat foods are going to have those phospholipids. Antioxidants and poly polyphenols in general, so thinking like resveratrol and PQQ and vitamin E and vitamin C, vitamin A, uh, carotenoids, uh, especially like lycopene, which you find in tomatoes, um, EGCG, which is found in like green tea, glutathione, melatonin. Um, so getting in a variety of fruits and vegetables in all sorts of colors. Remember, eat the rainbow. Uh, I, I tell people this all the time, and that's because eating the rainbow does so much for our body. It gives us so many different bioactives, which they're not nutrients in the body, but they are components of our uh, cellular metabolism and our chemical processes in the body. They actually go down to a genetic level, these bioactives, and can help turn on certain genes, turn off certain genes, um, can help reduce inflammation by, you know, turning off uh, certain genes in the body that promote inflammation. 
Um, so when I tell people to eat the colors of the rainbow, it's not just for fun. It's like there's, you get so many benefits. You get polyphenols, you get antioxidants, you get bioactives in there. Like, plus you get delicious flavors from your meals um, or from your food. So there's a lot to it. Um, but almonds and apricots, asparagus, avocado, bananas, beets, carrots, grapefruit, grapes, guava, kale, kiwi, onion, oranges, pecans, pumpkin, uh, quinoa, rutabaga, spinach, strawberries, tomatoes, and watermelon. Watermelon also has like in it too. Red cabbage, mangoes, which is high, they're high in vitamins A, C, and E, uh, baked potatoes, you know, baked potatoes are not, not necessarily like horrible. So um, you want to get quality potatoes. You want to make sure, you know, they've been grown in nutrient rich soil. You uh, want to have organic, um, you know, not genetically modified. Um, you can get so many great nutrients from and, and from the skins of the potato. Um, but also, if you allow potatoes to cool, they actually turn into this resistant starch. So the starch in the potato changes and actually feeds your gut bacteria. Um, it's it's really cool. So um, I just wanted to point that out to that, you know, baked potatoes. We have heard, you know, it's yes, it's a starchy vegetable. It's a starchy food um, and higher in carbs. But that shouldn't mean that we should ban it. Like there are so many other great things to it. Um, sunflower seeds, flax seeds, and bell peppers are also great. Um, getting in a variety of spices like basil, turmeric, paprika, get in those deep colors of spices. Uh, olives and olive oil, apples, those are all going to be rich sources of polyphenols and antioxidants and bioactives. PQQ, um, which you can find in natto, which mm, some people struggle with natto. It's very slimy texture. Um, so you might want to opt for more of like the spinach and various teas and bell peppers to get that PQQ, which helps, you know, bring energy and, and helps with that energy for the mitochondria. Blue spirulina is great. Uh, green tea, mushrooms in general, um, looking at chaga and cordyceps and reishi, they may protect mitochondria from the damages of free radicals and, you know, helping reduce those reactive oxygen species that are produced. Oh, that was a lot. Um, let me take a sip of water. At any time, um, if you're watching and you're like, hold on, wait, hold on, and you have a question, drop it in the comment section. I love, I, I just love this. I don't know if you can tell. Um, but again, polyphenols, um, like quercetin and resveratrol, um, hydroxytyrosol, which is found in olives and olive oil, they all scavenge, um, scavenge reactive oxygen species. They modulate mitochondrial biogenesis and more. So that's where, you know, the colors of the rainbow are really going to help support your mitochondria. Uh, <clears throat> so selenium in the right balance can protect against oxidative stress. Excessive selenium, though, can cause problems. Um, so you want to, you know, find that balance. Make sure that you're getting in enough selenium, um, but not getting in too much. So foods that are rich in selenium, Brazil nuts, chicken, eggs, pork, tuna, and turkey. Zinc, similar to selenium, very beneficial, plays a role alongside calcium in our mitochondrial redox regulation. Um, it's also an important antioxidant in the body, uh, but excessive zinc can contribute to oxidative stress, just like selenium too. So foods that are rich in zinc, um, adzuki seeds, pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, oysters, turkey, um, a lot of our meats are going to be rich in zinc, and organ meats are rich in zinc. Um, membrane phospholipids, like I mentioned, um, so like that PE that I mentioned before, um, you're going to find those in a variety of those um, high-quality meats, fish, um, coconut oil, olive and olive oil, like a lot of those high quality fats, you're going to find these phospholipids. So when we look at dietary patterns for mitochondria, so I just listed off a whole bunch of different nutrients and where you can find them in their foods. 
Um, but looking at dietary patterns, like what does this look in the grand scheme of things? Um, so before I get into like Mediterranean diet and, you know, this kind of stuff, I want to just briefly mention that, um, some dietary patterns like caloric restriction can actually be very beneficial for our mitochondria. Um, so according to a 2013 review, caloric restriction in terms of mitochondrial health varied, it varied from study to study, but generally there was a decrease in reactive oxygen species. So, you know, those, those little, little, um, biochemicals that go in and try to like kill off other cells and hurt other cells, um, those are decreased when caloric restriction, we saw a decrease in those um, harmful radicals from calorie caloric restriction. Um, and we started to see an increase in mitochondrial biogenesis. So biogenesis just means creating new mitochondria. So the body produces new mitochondria. So having that caloric restriction can actually help produce new mitochondria. Um, it supports mitochondrial quality control mechanisms as well, and is responsible for, for presenting, for preventing and repairing uh, damage. So caloric restriction has also been shown to help eliminate damaged mitochondria, so help get rid of them. We call that autophagy. Uh, another 2013 review concluded that an approach that includes caloric restriction, physical activity, um, and caloric restriction, mimetic supplementation may help promote mitochondrial efficiency. So getting in um, physical activity along with caloric restriction can help promote the efficiency of mitochondria in the body. So, and what caloric restriction looks like is gonna vary dependent on the person. So that's very, very individualized. There's no one size fit, fits all. So I can't like tell you here is what to do when it comes to caloric restriction. Um, it's going to vary based on the person. Intermittent fasting. So this can actually be a form of caloric restriction. So a lot of times, you know, I have clients and we give them a window where, you know, to consume your meals in, whether that's starting at, um, you eat from 8 a.m. until um, 4 p.m. or 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, so having, it could be you have a fasting window of 12 hours, you know, overnight, and then you have an eating window of 12 hours, or you can have a fasting window of 14 hours where you, you know, aren't eating for 14 hours. And then you have um, 10 hours where you can eat. So like it varies based on the person. For women, I tell people, I really tell them not to go above 16 hours of a fasting period. Um, just because if you're doing this, regularly, like every day, it can really start to, uh, to hurt thyroid um, and endocrine function for an adrenal function for, for women. It can be more stressful on the body. Um, but there are other forms of fasting too. So there's like the 5-2 fasting. There's, um, you know, where you have one day a week that you do fasting where, you know, you allow yourself like 500 calories maybe. Um, or less one of the days, and that's considered your fasting day, and then eat regularly for six of the days. So there's there's different things out there. Um, but intermittent fasting is a form of caloric restriction. So some studies found an increase in mitochondrial biogenesis, again, creating new mitochondria, and an increase in CERT3, um, which is a pathway in our body, like inflammatory pathway, it modulates the activities of different mitochondrial enzymes. Um, so we don't need to get in the nitty gritty of that one. Um, but again, gets down to that genetic um, level where, you know, different DNA can be turned on and off. A 2018 study showed that fasting helped protect mitochondria and helped them maintain efficient respiration, which is a process that generates cellular energy. Um, while improving blood glucose and lipid profiles in the body. So that was also consistent with a 2012 animal study that showed um, intermittent, intermittent fasting resulted in a decline in oxidative molecular damage and an increase in mitochondrial function. 
So then the ketogenic diet is also another diet that has been shown to decrease the number of reactive oxygen species and other free radicals that are created by the mitochondria. Um, there was an eight, 2018 review that showed that by dramatically shifting energy metabolism towards ketogenesis and fatty acid oxida oxidation, ketogenic diets are likely to have a profound effect on mitochondrial function. Again, it's going to vary based on the person. So someone may do better with inner, I mean, most everyone does better with intermittent fasting. Obviously there are certain conditions where fasting is not that great. If you're on certain medications or you have blood pressure issues, or, um, if you have, you know, blood sugar issues, intermittent fasting may not be right for you. Again, all depends on the person. Um, but by enhancing mitochondrial function, the ketogenic diet may also improve the body's resistance to certain chronic diseases like obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and neurodegenerative diseases as well. So ketogenic diet might be beneficial for some people, not great for other people. Some people need a higher carb diet and a lower or moderate fat amount in their diet. Um, whereas some people really do well with a lot lower carbs and higher fat, higher protein. So uh, it really depends on, on your body, on the person, what you can handle, your lifestyle, all that. Some other broad patterns. So the Mediterranean diet, um, research to this specific diet is limited, but it may beneficially impact mitochondrial health by positively influencing um, those reactive oxygen species. So, you know, decreasing because... Mediterranean diet is really antioxidant packed. Um, when you are getting a lot of different antioxidants in the body, it's going to help with scavenging those free radicals, you know, that are doing harm um, and support the mitochondria because Mediterranean diet involves plenty of colors from plants. So you're going to get a lot of great nutrients there. A 2004 review explained that the healthy dietary fats found in the Mediterranean diet are what really help mitochondria as well. So this has been consistent with other research that shows the Mediterranean diet is an ideal anti-aging diet. Um, Mediterranean diet also features other nutrients that have been shown to support mitochondria, including CoQ10 and resveratrol. So... Um, the WALS protocol. I don't know if anyone has heard of the WALS protocol, um, but there is a doctor who just amazingly, um, I don't want to say it like reversed her multiple sclerosis, but greatly, greatly, greatly positively impacted her multiple sclerosis and like was able to get rid of debilitating systems symptoms by following a um, specific dietary pattern. Um, and it's called the walls protocol. So she's like, she's done amazing stuff for, for autoimmune conditions in general. Um, and her protocol has helped a lot of people. So the wall can help with mitochondrial dysfunction as well. So Avoiding foods that contain gluten, dairy, eggs, processed meats um, that contain nitrates and anything sweetened with sugar, getting rid of all of that stuff. Um, and then some people take it a, a step further if necessary by avoiding all grains, legumes, peanuts, and soy. And I'm just giving a broad overview right now because again, we are at, it's been, um, you know, 33 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've been talking about the diet, so I'm not getting like too, too, too much into specific protocols, but looking into these different protocols, is great. Um, but yeah, avoiding, you know, all grains, legumes, peanuts, and soy by taking it a step further with the Walls protocol um, and eating six to nine cups of vegetables and fruit a day. So making sure that you are including three greens in your day, including three deeply colored vegetables in your day and fruits, uh, three vegetables that are rich in sulfur, like arugula, three servings, I should say, uh, arugula, broccoli, bok choy, et cetera. Um, making sure that you're getting in six to 12 ounces of grass fed meat or wild caught fish daily. So getting in that high quality protein. Um, and then 
optional, like for taking it that next step further. She also will have people do like 14 fluid ounces of full fat coconut milk as well. Um, and this diet also can, you know, go along that ketogenic spectrum if you do the full version of it. So you're going to have higher fats and lower carbs if you go all in on the walls protocol. So dietary patterns, we really want to have an emphasize, we really want to emphasize um, fiber rich foods in general to help our mitochondria. So that would be including apples, garlic, asparagus, leeks, Jerusalem artichoke, bananas, dandelion greens, chicory root, onions, jicama root, lentils, split peas, black beans and pinto beans, kidney beans, chickpeas, chia seeds, flax seeds, brown flax seeds, uh, raspberries and blackberries are great. Barley, um, making sure that you're having high quality, non-GMO, organic. Um, if you have a gluten problem, avoid barley. Pears, almonds, oats, broccoli, quinoa, avocados, green peas, Brussels sprouts. These are all so rich in fiber um, and also help feed our good gut bacteria too, which is what we want, um, as well as aid our mitochondria. Uh, incorporating bone broth is also so healing for our mitochondria. It's rich in glutamine and other amino acids that are especially good for healing a leaky gut too. Um, so you get this double whammy. Um, you're helping your mitochondria and you're healing leaky gut. Woohoo! Amping up your detoxification supporting foods. So a lot of us are carrying a heavy burden of toxins and we are not detoxifying the way that we need to. We're not supporting our detoxification. Um, we're needing help in that. These foods also contain power, powerful bioactives. Um, so looking at your allium vegetables, like your chives, your garlic, your leeks, your onions, scallions, um, shallots, those are all high, um, high detox foods. Uh, apiaceous vegetables like celery um, and celeriac root, carrots, anise or anise. I always say that wrong. Um, angelica, caraway, chervil, coriander, and cilantro, cumin, dill, fennel, parsley, and parsnip. Um, those are all going to be belong to that apiaceous vegetable family. Uh, black raspberry, black tea. Teas are so, so good for our detox um, system and so healing in general. So get a variety of teas in. Oh, so great. Um, and it'll be great for the mitochondria. Black tea, blueberry, chamomile tea, chicory root is another great one and a great um, coffee alternative. You can use chicory root and dandelion root. Um, as a coffee alternative, it has that like earthy flavor, provides you with energy because hi, you're supporting your mitochondria, um, but you're also providing some fiber for your gut bacteria. You are helping your, like, oh, you're helping so many systems. I could go on. Um, but again, now I'm <laughs> nearing 40 minutes. Um, citrus, coffee. Um, again, look for, you know, the high quality coffees, organic coffees don't have mycotoxins have been have been tested for mycotoxins um cruciferous vegetables like arugula bok choy broccoli and broccoli sprouts brussels sprouts cabbage cauliflower collard greens kale kohlrabi mustard greens radishes rutabaga turnips turnip greens and watercress um beet greens are also going to be another one too that are great curry dandelion tea garlic ghee ginger grapefruit green tea honey bush tea getting in leafy greens like chard and Swiss chard, endive, um, beet greens are great here, spinach, lettuce, radicchio, peppermint tea, pomegranate, purple sweet potato, uh, rooibos tea, rosemary, and rosemary tea, uh, soybean and black soybean, again, high quality, organic, non-GMO, and turmeric. Those are all detox aiding, which toxins, are everywhere. We need to detox um, and they can make our mitochondria go haywire. Um, so make sure you're incorporating those, those foods. So those are all the different nutrients and foods and where to find, you know, what foods to find these nutrients in. Um, I don't know if I said that backwards, but uh, I just presented you with a lot of stuff. The big picture is to get in high quality fats, get in high quality proteins at your meals and get in at least seven 
I tell people at least seven servings of vegetables a day and then get in um, like two servings of fruit. Um, but get in a variety of colors, get in those detox supporting veggies, um, get in those leafy greens, get in just all the different colors that you can, you guys. Um, but then alongside our great diet that we're incorporating, exercise is key. Um, you know, it requires a great deal of energy to power our muscles, putting a burden on muscle mitochondria. This signals energetic demand to the rest of the cell. Our muscle cells respond by producing more mitochondria and more mitochondrial enzymes. This increases our respiratory capacity of the muscle. Um, so their ability to produce ATP from nutrients to power muscle contraction. So, um, you know, make sure that you're lifting weights, make sure that you are walking, um, sweating is going to help with detox. It's, it's awesome. Um, exercise performance improves with training and that just shows right there. The mitochondria are enhancing, becoming more functional. Um, you're increasing the amount it's, it's wonderful. So when your exercise performance increases, you know, you're doing the right thing and things are working and like the system is working. One of the best ways to improve mitochondrial biogenesis and function in aging muscle is to help delay age related, age related decline in our mitochondrial activity and our muscle health. So make sure that you're getting in your strength, make sure that you're having, um, uh, do, having proper flexibility of your muscles too. So that's where like yoga can really help. Um, with that flexibility, it helps with detox because of certain positions help with aiding, you know, detox, detoxification from the cells and it helps with strength of the muscle, um, body weight. You don't have to have weights. You can do body weight for strength training too. Um, and then getting in movement like swimming or biking or walking, um, whatever movement means to you that brings you joy, but makes you sweat is going to be great. Adequate and quality sleep um, is important and key to our mitochondrial function. So brain accumulates a lot of metabolic waste. We need to have that quality sleep so that it can get rid of that waste. Um, so that, you know, that waste is not toxic to our mitochondria. Make sure we're incorporating relaxation techniques. That chronic stress is not good for our mitochondria. Um, getting in enough sunlight. So getting in that vitamin D. Uh, if you don't get in enough sunlight, like, here in Minnesota, um, then supplementation is typically your next best thing. Um, having red or near infrared light therapy enhances the efficiency of our mitochondria and energy production, cold exposure, shivering releases heat in the process of burning fuels. Um, it uses ATP to power muscle contraction. So that recruits our mitochondria to indirectly generate heat. Um, so we can have that mitochondrial biogenesis occurring again um, and increase in that mitochondrial function and activity. Cold showers or cryotherapy can boost our mitochondria to help keep us warm. Heat exposure. So it acts as a stress, mild stress, and um, you know triggers cell responses that promote adaptation, and that includes our mitochondria um, so that you know they can increase in their functional capacity. So it puts some stress on our mitochondria. Uh, again, if heat like triggers you with fibromyalgia, you might not want to do that one. Try the other things first. So main goal in our overall approach to helping our mitochondria reduce inflammation in the body. There could, depends on the person. What is leading to that inflammation? We need to get rid of it. Um, so that's going to look different for everyone. Take away the offenders and support our mitochondria with the beneficial nutrients, like I just mentioned. Um, with that said, I apologize that that turned into 45 minutes. Um, please let me know your thoughts, your comments, um, if this was helpful for you, if you wanna dive into another layer. Um, if you do, let me know what you would like to learn more about because I wanna bring that to you. I hope that you are enjoying your Wednesday, you guys. I keep saying it, but spring is coming. I'm so pumped for it. You know, it keeps me going. Um, but I, I, again, I would love to know, you know, if you found this helpful, what you would like to learn more on when it comes to our mitochondria or the nutrients. Um, and yeah, have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. I know that was a lot. Um, 
I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. You guys take care.